there's a saying that goes something like this. The present is a future later to be told. It's a bit chewy, isn't it? The present is a future later to be told. In other words, we cannot understand the present. We cannot assign meaning to the present. We assign meaning only by looking back after time has woven our life, that we can look back at this moment and say, aha, Surely you can think of an example in your own life, an experience, and you look back from the perspective of hindsight. That is what history is, friends. It's an interpretation of an event based on the events that followed it. And the Gospels are certainly like this, and certainly the Gospel of Matthew the story of this Jesus of Nazareth is told this side of the resurrection. Matthew is retelling the story of Jesus with the end in mind. For he has been forever changed by the ending of this story. Not just the story of Jesus, in fact, but all through the scriptures, what we would call the Old Testament, all of history itself is seen and told, filled, illuminated with the stunning mystery of the risen Christ. Well, today is our patronal feast, the feast of St. Matthew. Thank you for the light correction there. <clears throat> It took me a long time, to tell you the truth, to kind of warm up to Matthew's gospel, to Matthew's Jesus, because I found it so otherworldly. It was almost like this Jesus was, was floating about in radiant light. I found it hard to relate to him, given my modern sensibilities and all. I mean, Jesus was a man, after all, wasn't he? For Matthew, who is looking back at the events he is telling, from the place of what he would call the end times, the new kingdom has arrived, the Messiah has come, the age is fulfilled in a marvelous act revealed on the cross and in his rising from the dead. And this, to use a fancy theological term, is what we call the eschaton, eschatology, <laughs> the fulfillment of all things, which we say has begun in Jesus and will be fulfilled again at the end of time. We are given the great uh, act of the Eucharist, which is a foretaste of the kingdom. It's a moment when the fullness of time, that fullness of realized reality, breaks into time and is realized together as Christ's body at this table. It's interesting, isn't it, to reflect a little bit about time. At least I find time a rather interesting thing because our journey on time is a linear experience, isn't it? It's a journey with beginnings and endings, past and future. In contrast, it is Augustine who would say, God sees time all at once, like looking at a painting. God sees time all at once, like looking at a painting. God sees everything fulfilled. I think that's what living in the infinite must be like. God sees things as they really, truly are. Not halfway, not almost there. 
God sees life as it really is. God sees life in its fully realized true being. And God sees you as you really are. God sees you as the fullness of you that God created, loved and breathed you into being. God sees you in your utter nakedness and beauty, the forever you. That's amazing. Matthew. Matthew writes himself into his miraculous story in a few lines, a few simple words. He says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Jesus saw Matthew. Jesus saw. He saw him. The one he knit in Matthew's mother's womb. God saw his beloved child. God looked and saw him, warts and all, whatever burden, whatever shame, whatever sin, whatever hidden wounds, sorrows, Matthew the tax collector, but all that baggage is dissolved in being seen by God. What, friends, does that feel like? What would happen if you let yourself be seen by God? Would you still struggle so hard to hide your little shames, to prove your worth through your success in the eyes of others? Would you navigate your journey on the payout of your own efforts, the idols of climbing whatever hill you can, or wallow in self-pity? God looks into history, into time, and sees you as you truly are, not your sin and not your brokenness. He sees you in the fullness that he created you to be. And he invites us, if we let him, he invites us just as he invited Matthew, follow me. As he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Is there anyone here who is in not of need of the physician? This morning, I was reminded at our chapel service with our friend uh, Bev, who sat on the board with me of Center 454. Center 454 is one of our community ministries that I had the privilege of serving at as a chaplain for many years. And when I arrived there some, gosh, 15 years ago, it was when crack cocaine had really hit the streets and changed all of our uh, day programs and our social service agencies forever. So quickly addictive and such a powerful high that just almost overnight, it was a, the landscape completely changed. And we were suddenly in this situation where we had to keep barring people. You, we, we bar people at a center, at one of our drop-in centers, when their behavior becomes unsafe, either to themselves or others. And we suddenly, we had more people barred than we were actually coming to the center because their behavior was becoming so erratic, so, so, so difficult. 
And one of our uh, leaders, a mentor of mine, a fellow by the name of Dave Rayner, anyone who's been involved with community ministries would know Big Dave, thought of creating, what are we going to do about the outcast of the outcast? I mean, they're not even welcome amongst the outcast, this bunch. So they created a program in the afternoons where there was a room that was sort of safely cordoned off and we'd kind of hand out some water through the door. We just didn't know what else to do. And the little card that we passed around on the street to tell people about they could come and get some water or some socks in the wintertime or we'll hand you some mittens, you know. On the back of it was a quote from uh, St. Teresa, the newly St. Teresa. And she says this, the feeling of being unloved or unwanted is the greatest poverty. The feeling of being unloved or unwanted, that's the true poverty. It was an amazing experience for me to realize that even the outcast of the outcast, at the center of their soul, share the same yearning and need to know they are beloved as me. And all of us, deep down, have that same yearning and need and hunger, which is ultimately only fulfilled in God. And that's why we're here, after all, isn't it? We gather at this table. We sing Him. We pray. And in that very act of prayer and Him, we are allowing ourselves to be seen by God. That's what we're doing. I don't think God is there thinking, oh, this feels so nice that everyone's saying all these nice things about me. No, he is yearning to love you. And when we stand and turn ourselves towards God in praise and him, we are laying ourselves bare before God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are the merciful. This is the blessedness, friends, that we human beings are called to be. Matthew's Jesus, the one I found so hard to relate to, I've come to discover is what a human being is supposed to be. Matthew's Jesus is the Jesus realized in all of his fullness. And Jesus shows us what a true, fully realized human being is. We don't strive to be divine like Jesus. We strive to be as human as Jesus. That's what a human being is. So we give thanks, friends, for this Matthew, this tax collector and his den of thieves who have been seen by God they now see with the end in mind. Love crucified and risen. They see the present with the end in mind. And that makes all the difference.